Okay. Okay, everybody. This is Jason Eagle, your Natural Health Authority, with a, <clears throat> another show today. And um, so, again, this is Jason Eagle, your Natural Health Authority. Let's go over the basics, which is how to get a hold of me, who I am. Um, my company is Strategic Healing. You can reach the office, which is 734 985 5891. Um, you can also uh, go to my website, which is strategichealing.us. Um, podcasts, um, you can go to my podcast. It's called Healing Matters. Um, I also do these live, which is on my Facebook page, which is Strategic Healing. And then later I post these uh, videos, radio shows, videos, uh, podcasts, <laughs> the whole thing, <laughs> on my uh, YouTube channel, which is Jason Eagle QRA. That's a Q, an R, and an A. That stands for Quantum Reflex Analysis. And that's what I am. I'm a Quantum Reflex Analysis Practitioner. And um, what that means is I do a natural health practice of where what I do is I use um, natural supplements, all naturally derived supplements. Um, what is a supplement? Supplement is basically um, you are what you eat. And more importantly, you suffer from what you have a deficiency of. So pain and disease and other things, uh, even traumatic type of stuff, which you say, well, you know, okay, if you got in a car crash or, you know, someone tackled you on, on the, the uh, field and you had an injury, that's not a deficiency. Well, uh, it can be a lot of times how bad you get injured, how quickly you recover, and even how brittle your bones are and how weak your joints are. So as people get older and older and as their nutrition goes down and the resiliency goes down, when they fall on the ice, they shatter a hip. Whereas when you're a little kid, that same type of fall and even 20 times more, you just roll and bounce off of it. Um, and, you know, the bones uh, bend rather than breaking. The, the joints will, will bend and, and, and snap back and things like that. So typically, you know, you say, uh, you know, well, what is, you know, what can a supplement protect against? We know that it can protect against, for instance, getting sick because your immune system is low. So that's what vitamin C and all kinds of other things, a zinc, um, vitamin D, these, these basics, which are well, even the medical communities is not even woe to, to say, yeah, that's true. Like basically we all know that vitamin C uh, helps in so many different ways, including with the real debilitating things like scurvy. And I'm going to talk later about Franco bruising and things like that. Um, so, but, but let's get to the nitty gritty, which is, can't you just eat it, right? If you have a deficiency in, let's say, vitamin E, or you have a deficiency in vitamin A, we know that people, you know, develop rickets, um, when they're born, which is this joint problem from having too deficient of uh, vitamin A. Um, we also know, like, for instance, uh, a um, deficiency in um, folic acid puts newborn babies at risk for spina bifida, meaning they actually, if they, what is spina bifida? They're born with part of their spine, spinal cord outside of their body instead of being inside. You know, sometimes you have babies born with their hearts born outside of the body, really, really tragic type of stuff. And sometimes they can have surgery to repair it. But those come from, that's an example of a nutritional deficiency. How, how bad can it be? It can be bad, right? Now, let's say you're born normal, but let's say you're just eating the standard American diet, which is super, super demineralized. We, the fruits and vegetables that we grow here, people say, I eat healthy. Well, but if you're eating a healthy American, it's not the same thing as, as if you're eating healthy um, Haitian <laughs> or healthy mm, Iraq or healthy Africa or healthy Spanish, Spain, um, Japan, um, Germany, you go all over the world and, and, and the people's health, they show it. You can look all over the world and, and especially these areas called the blue zones where they have more people in certain countries, in certain parts of the world because of the nutrition, because of how people live their lives. 
where they have the lowest forms of the debilitating diseases, including cancer, and they have the oldest living, uh, what's called centrogenarians, people, people over 100, and these are not people in a nursing home. These are people that are out and about, still working in their garden, stuff like that. Um, Okinawa, Japan, um, Sardinia in Spain, um, the Eskimos, um, there's a little town outside of California, I can't think of the name, it, it, it's a hippie town, right? But again, they don't eat, they, there's no Walmart there, right? They don't buy their food at Target, they're eating locally, that's what's common about these things, these places, and because the level of nutrition is up, and that's because the level of nutrition comes from the ground that they eat of. Now this also transfers into meat, okay? Let's say you are eating just regular old hamburger. You're eating, you know, a Wendy's burger, or let's say you go to the store and you buy the cheap, you know, 85, 20, or whatever it is, a uh, hamburger. That's just coming from factory feedlot uh, animals. And most of those animals are fattened up on corn and grain and soybeans, of which are just full on GMO and again, go to where the corn is grown. It, that's most of the farmers. They just grow corn and soybeans on the same plot of land again and again, generation after generation. And the only reason it's able to grow at all is because they use these fertilizers. I, I don't know about you, but I've been to some of these factory farms and it's complete sand. It is sand. It is, they've grown on it so many years, like these old farms. I was out in California where they grow the lettuces and, and these, these deep valleys that are were old glaciated valleys and old, actually, California was an old, used to be, California was an island. And then, uh, and, uh, but also too, there was a sea there. That's where you get the um, salt flats. Is there was an inland sea as well too. And in, up to even fairly recently, and I'm talking the last few hundred years, few hundred years, that's, um, so when, Americans or people went to California, they saw that land and it was so d dramatically fertile. Well, especially in the, um, the valleys where uh, the um, uh, lettuce is grown, they've grown it there so long that there are no nutrients, there's no minerals left at in that soil and it's pure sand. And it's actually because of the um, um, tractors and things, they've compacted it and it's like concrete. If you get into some of the uh, technologies and even big factory farming, they have to use these deep drills. They have to use all kinds of things in order to revivify the soil. But one thing's for sure is that beautiful green um, lettuce is grown in a completely, basically dead soil. And so the plants are getting zero nutrients whatsoever from the ground. And the only way that they can grow is because they spray them with the NPK, which is nutrient, potassium, and phosphorus, um, which is, they all come from chemicals. They all come from, you know, not natural. And it it's, there's only three things that they put in there. Whereas out in the wild, there's thousands of things that the plants need. That's why your tomatoes taste like cardboard and, and, and it, it, strawberries look great, and beautiful, but they just are like, what? They, they're tasteless and, and so many generations have gotten used to it. That's all minerals. You take a, a really well-grown strawberry or a tomato and not only does it taste sweet, it tastes a little bit of salty too. Like anyone in the food industry knows that the salty sweet, if you want something to be sweet. So again, like take an apple, a sweet apple, take even like a tart apple, like say a Granny Smith. So people don't like to eat Granny Smith, but Granny Smiths are very sweet, but they also are very, very tart. Put a little bit of salt on that Granny Smith. And now the person who's like, ooh, that's too sour. They go, mmm, or put a little salt on some lemon. And it makes, now the lemon, instead of being so tart, it makes it sweeter. That's what caramel corn, caramel corn has some sweet in it, you know, the salted caramel. So salt makes things taste sweeter. And so when you're tasting a really good grown vegetable or fruit, it almost tastes like it has some salt in it. And it does because it's pulling minerals out of the ground. And um, the, the sugar content is related to minerals. So this is also part of science. It's what's called the BRICS sugar. Uh, there's a device that you can actually take some juice from a vegetable or a plant or something like that. And uh, I have one of them. And um, so scientifically you can tell, like they use this for grapes. 
They also use it for anything. Um, and so the Brick's sugar content, which means you can see how much sugar's in that. Well, the reason for tasting for grapes is so to see when they're ready to harvest, but you also look at it during the middle of the year and something like that, because there's been something known, which is the higher the Brick's sugar content is inside a fruit or vegetable, the greater disease resistance because the fruit or vegetable has more minerals. The more minerals that it has, the more it's able to up its sugar content and be edible for animals, right? And attractive, because keep in mind, the, the fruits and vegetables, they wanna share their seed. They want the animal to eat it. So the more delicious and sweet smelling and sweet tasting, the more that an animal will eat that and then poop its seeds out or something like that. So that's how it gets delivered. But the thing is, is that, it scientifically, they know that the higher the level is of, let's say, corn or any vegetable, it's not just about, oh, it tastes better. It's about they know the reason they're, they're shooting for more sugar in it is because when you get up to the highest levels of sugar, so let's say corn can be 24. So 24 corn, 22, 20, 22 is really good. 24 corn is like that is is disease free. So it cannot catch a disease, meaning it cannot get the rust, it cannot get the rot, it cannot get the fungus. And normally you would say, well, we need to put fungicides and stuff like that. Okay, well, that, that's a chemical. What we know is, is that the healthier the minerals are in the soil, the healthier the plant is, the more sugar that's inside, more minerals that's inside the plant, it doesn't matter how toxic the, you know, stuff is around it, it's fine and it cannot get a disease. That is true about humans too. The more mineralized and the more vi the more nutrients that we have in our body. So going back again, why supplements? Because if you've been eating something that is just cardboard or styrofoam for so many years, you, you've depleted your essential nutrients. And if you were to then switch to say eating those foods, even getting your best organic, you'd have to eat so much for so long, it's impossible. You couldn't do it. And, and so you would still be unhealthy and you would still possibly be sick. So the supplements come to the rescue because you can take those same nutrients, those food-based nutrients, and by processing them naturally, drying them out and stuff like that, removing the water, and it's just as simple as, as taking the water out of something and freeze drying something. Now, instead of being able to stomach five of them, you could stomach 500 of them, which means you can increase the amount of, of nutrients that you get. So you get super, super power packed, which means when you take supplements, natural whole food supplements that are, are uniquely crafted this way, then instead of it taking you years to erase the decades of what you've done, not knowingly, you can do it in a matter of months. So the amount of the ability, nutrients or supplements give you the ability to reverse the process and take and, and warp speed it, go much, much faster. And then once you get your, for instance, your levels up, let's say magnesium or these different things, now you can go back to, you don't have to take the supplements forever because a lot of people, they think, I don't like drugs and I don't like supplements because I'm gonna have to be on these for the rest of my life not a, a supplement. If you do it correctly, once you fill up that hole, then you can go back to normal eating. You know, hopefully by that time you've changed your eating and you are much healthier in terms of you have a much more balanced diet and stuff like that. However, um, then that means that you don't have to take these supplements, which are expensive, right? They can be. And so that means doing something correctly and uh, at high enough levels and strategically and targeted, meaning I'm going to do this, 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 this. If you do it correctly for a few months, hard, right? And oftentimes that's what it takes, which is, listen, don't, don't putz out now. Don't, don't quit now. Stick with it. Stick with your regimen. Stick with your regime. You mean I'm going to have to take 20 of these things a day? Yes. How long? Give it a good month, two months, three months. Give it a good three months. Sometimes we change it up. But isn't that worth it? Wouldn't that be worth it to be able to erase years of stuff in about three months? And all it just takes is just for you to just stick with it. 
And uh, yes, I know it can be difficult, especially when you are in use, but it's all habitual. Anything can become a habit. I wasn't, it, it, let's make it simple. It's taken, you know, a couple handfuls of stuff at the most at certain times a day with some water and taking it with food. And, and when you do a program with me, I give you a very specific program that like I take all the guesswork out and it's just stupid, you know, easy. You can print it up and put it in your refrigerator. You can have it on your phone. You can have it in your computer, your, you know, so that you can refer back to it. And eventually you get to the point where it's just like you, you're, um, you memorize it, right? And it becomes easy. And then, and then there's other things that we do too, is, is I will oftentimes recommend certain diets. And later today, I'm going to talk about this blood type diet. I get a lot of people that over the years that have asked, have you heard about the blood type diet? What is it? You know, it's everyone's a certain blood type and you can get your blood tested. Am I type O, type O positive? Am I an A, am I B, A, B negative? All these different types of stuff. So the idea is, is that, you know, what type of blood are you? Does that determine what type of food you are? What type of foods you should eat? Because if you're eating the wrong types of foods, you're just going to make yourself miserable. So I will do that later. That's one of the questions that comes later. So this is Jason Eagle, your natural health authority. And um, we're going to get into this first question here, which is really apropos for what we're going through right now in this day and age and this time, which is stress relief. I'm hearing a lot of people that are dealing with stress. I'm hearing a lot of people that are dealing with what would be known as panic attacks. Um, let me describe that too and where they feel it. A lot of people are feeling it in their chest or feeling it in their bellies, uh, like a weight. Um, they're feeling a, um, a flutter. Um, they feel like their, their heart is kind of skipping a beat. People having difficulty sleeping. Um, people feeling like that um, flutteriness in the middle of the night. Um, people having to get up multiple times the night to uh, go to the bathroom when they normally wouldn't. Um, and it's not that they're sitting there, you know, worrying. Some people are, but it's just, it's out of the ordinary. Um, that being said is, is, let me tell you, this time right now, wherever you are in the world, in the United States, we are going through things that are not just the political type of stuff, not just the COVID stuff, although that's a huge part of it. We are all under post-traumatic stress disorder, lockdowns, all this other stuff. But we are also in a perfect storm of other things that are going on. Um, one of the things that I can tell you right now is, is we are in the lunar phase and we had a big full moon. Anytime full moons come around, um, especially big ones, this big blue moon, um, uh, on Halloween, which is, uh, forget about what time that is in terms of all of the different stories that we heard about. It's a specific time where it's a cycle. It's a cycle where different things happen in terms, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we are at, there's hurricanes that we've been going through right now and barometric pressure and wind uh, is <clears throat> affects people an awful lot. I talked about this before uh, over in Europe. Uh, uh, I think it's in Finland in particular. They have special names, just like the Eskimos have like 50 names for, for snow. Um, they have 50 names for wind, okay? And one of the winds that is the ones that they shut the schools down and many surgeons will not do specific types of surgery, especially ones where they have people that having a bleeding diathesis, meaning it's hard for them to clot their blood, they will not do it on a time which is called a fund, F-U-N-D-T. And that's when it's not just high winds, but it is when the winds suddenly reverse their course. Uh, if you live in an area, you know, the wind typically moves, the jet stream typically moves in a particular way, especially in Finland where they're on, it's coastal, um, there's certain areas where it's just the same way and it's year after year after year, but you can have certain times of the year and in certain years are worse than others where the wind gets really heavy and it goes backwards. And what they say is take the kids out of school because they're all crazy. They literally go nuts and because their, their brains don't work the way that they should. Their emotions are, uh, they're on hyper alert. They can't pay attention. Um, even the doctors basically say, we're not gonna do these surgeries because we've noticed that the blood doesn't clot correctly. Um, and so your real high risky ones, they say, let's just wait for this to clear. Let's wait for the weather to clear. There are certain um, 
again, certain full moons, uh, certain times when we come to, we're also coming to the time where we're just, sh we just change the time zone, okay? And so people are literally, their body time clock is still off from the actual clock, right? They're not the same thing. And it takes a number of days. And so many people are literally in some kind of like jet lag. Um, uh, this, you put all of this stuff together and it means that are, there are some real forces that are squeezing and squeezing and releasing, squeezing and releasing, pumping people. And that pumps your blood, but it pumps your immune system. It pumps your brain, um, which means it's kind of like, I would say, like the voodoo drums, like, doom, 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 doom. you know, people are going crazy. Um, and, and, but it's this time of year, this time of year always does this, but some years particularly are worse than others. All things being equal, like take out the whole political type of thing and also take out the, you know, uh, the things that are happening in society. Um, this happens this time of year and there's all kinds of things that, and so that's part of what the stress is going on with. And so here are some of the, the different remedies, um, I talked about tyrosine. Tyrosine is these, um, it helps with the shakes. People where they get like this, because the, the adrenals. Because when people, especially with the post-traumatic stress just one, um, your adrenals, your adrenaline glands are, are there for you to escape from the monster, from, you know, the lion that's attacking you. Or it's to make you freeze when, you know, um, the monster comes in and you become like a rabbit and you just like, <laughs> don't let them see me. These are all survival mechanisms type of stuff. And um, when people go through layers of stress, so when you see people that are in prison, when you see people that have been, uh, for instance, in concentration camps or things like that, or people that like, for instance, are under a deposition by um, a court, or let's say people that are awaiting trial, um, people that have gone to war um, in terms that they are in a war zone and there's bombs going off, um, uh, people that are in the middle of a divorce, these are all things that are, they're all equal, which is they put people through a post-traumatic stress disorder, which is you are running your system inside like crazy. You're sitting there doing nothing, but your mind is going a million miles a minute and your heart is palpitating and stuff like that. And your muscles are tense. You're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Well, over a period of time, what that does is that uses up nutrients. It uses up minerals and it uses up the amino acids that make your muscles work and things like that. So tyrosine is one of these amino acids that helps us to build the uh, hormones that are the happy hormones or the anti-depression, anti-anxiety hormones because a feeling is a hormone, a feeling of joy and happiness and excitement that's, that's dopamine, that's serotonin, that's norepinephrine, those types of things. Whereas cortisol, um, cortisone, um, these other, uh, homocysteine, um, these adrenaline, um, these things are other hormones that are on the other side of it, which is prepare for war. Um, and it's there for, for survival mechanisms. But when you are, so again, like I said, when you see people that are, for instance, have been w awaiting trial or something like that, which is they are forced to live in an environment where it's unknown and they don't know what's going to happen. You do that for a good three months, people are going to show up and they're going to start having post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, PTSD, which is that heart palpitations, this feeling of uneasy, uh, easiness, this feeling of queasiness, depression. Um, I mean, uh, the sky's the limit of all kinds of things. People, um, anxiety, right? Which means it's a response to your environment. And so until the environment changes, so the problem with that was, it would be great if you could just take a vacation, right? <laughs> you know, But we can't, We you can't go to that beach. They won't let you. <laughs> so uh, first of all, it's the biochemical things that we can deal with. Number one, like I said, tyrosine. Um, three of them in the on an empty stomach. Um, it can be taken morning or afternoon, um, but on an empty stomach. And that helps with the shakes, um, that kind of qu quivering inside. Tranquinol. Tranquinol can be taken 
like four of them at bedtime and it will help you to fall asleep. You can also take them during the middle of the day. Let's say you know that you're going to go into a, a meeting. Um, you know, Zoom is coming and you're not looking forward to talking to them. You know, you're going to a dentist appointment or something like that. You can take one, two, three, like before a dentist appointment, uh, you can take like six of them, like right away, right before that. And it's not going to make you pass out. It's just going to help you to, you know, feel better. Okay. Magnesium. Oftentimes our muscles are so tight. We're just holding on to the wheel of life and we're not white knuckled. You know, you're white knuckling it. And keep in mind to hold that stress, you're using up energy and you are um, depleting your reserves of magnesium. And magnesium is the thing that makes it release. Because see, you can be holding on so long that you say, okay, it's time to let go. I can't. They're stuck. My hands are frozen there because there's the magnesium has to go in in order to release it. So providing magnesium is something that's really, really helpful in terms of people being able to help with stress relief. It's a chemical. It's, it's a mineral that goes in. Um, adrenaline, meaning we are all living in this post-traumatic stress disorder type of thing. And so that means we are burning the candle at both ends with our adrenals. And so adrenaline support, adrenaline is the supplement that helps with um, uh, rebuilding the exhausted adrenaline, meaning you're not going to get out of it. You might as well just go through it. And so just support it, right? Um, so fermented cordyceps, that's a, it's a mushroom. Um, that's a really, really great thing. There's this other uh, herb called Eleuthero. Eleuthero root is wonderful in terms of being able to help with um, rebuilding the adrenalines. Uh, organic Corella, organic burdock root, um, bromelain from uh, pineapple, Japanese knotweed, that is a... Um, uh, resveratrol, but it doesn't come from grapes, so it doesn't have any of the possible toxic side effects because uh, grapes are, grape skins are very good in resveratrol. Resveratrol is one of these things that's really good for the heart. It's a master antioxidant, and I know people that have had AFib and other heart fluctuation type of weird flutter stuff that finally the resveratrol was the only thing that fixed it because it's an antioxidant. And then um, this also has this other thing, which is known to be a adaptogen. So taking adaptogens for your adrenals is called rhodiola. Rhodiola is this wonderful herb, um, rhodiola rosacea, or rosea, uh, which kind of looks like a rose, like a red rose. Um, it's one of these things that helps to balance your hormones. And so since your adrenals are a hormonal organ because adrenaline is a hormone, okay? Um, what it does is it just helps to rebuild your adrenaline. Since we are burning these, these uh, adrenaline glands so much, we need something to just kind of repair them. Um, the hemp extract that has CBD, um, the cannabinoids has, I know a lot of people that have been very, very happy with that in terms of just helping them. And you can take them, you know, before you go to bed or you could take it a little bit throughout the day. So if you normally it would be like, say, two dropper fulls that helps you fall asleep, just take, let's say, a third of a dropper full or a half dropper full or even maybe like four to, you know, between two and six drops um, during the middle of the day. And it just kind of helps to kind of take the edge off for people that it works for. Um, sea salt. If you are going through stressful times, make sure you do not deplete your salt. Um, and so that means taking a little bit extra salt. Take some sea salt, about a half teaspoon in some water and drink it down. If you are, let's say, 150 pounds or more, let's say 180 pounds, you should be a full teaspoon of sea salt a day, especially when you're going through stressful times. Um, remember, it's always great for like babies and children to take a bath. Well, you were once and you still are. You're still that little kid at heart. There's nothing like taking a nice Epsom salt bath with some nice smelling stuff in it, like whether it be lavender or, you know, some good smelly stuff. And it will just help you to relax. Four pounds of Epsom salt and you stay in the bathtub for about an hour. You'll come out like a soaked gummy bear. You <laughs> will feel so relaxed. But see, that's because it's replacing a, uh, a deficient um, 
uh, mineral. And then the person goes, well, can I, is it good to just do it once? Well, if you are in the middle of a stressful thing, meaning you're going to sleep good tonight, but you'll wake up and you're going to start it. This is Groundhog's Day. We're going to go through this again and again and again. So developing stress relieving strategies is super, super important. Um, again, um, learning to do, for instance, uh, the silent prayer or meditation. So people who don't want to get into, let's say, Zen or Buddhist meditation, you don't have to. Meditation is just sitting in a comfortable place and you can close your eyes if you want to. And it's just breathing nice and deep and slowly. You can do what's called square breathing, which is basically you take a breath and you count in your head and you count like three seconds. So count like one, two, three, hold your breath, two, three, Exhale, two, three, hold your breath, two, three. So it's an inhale on three, a hold on three, an exhale on three, and a hold on three. So it's just. Deep belly breathing, rhythmic breathing, breathing, feel the breathing go into your belly, into your diaphragm. And the silent prayer is just sitting there and you can sit in the dark. Sometimes it's actually very helpful to go in the dark. Uh, with the, the Bible talks about like your prayer closet, literally go into your closet. And a lot of times you can close the door and you can still see some light under the crack of the door. Uh, put a little, you know, towel or there's something like that. you want it pitch black sit in pitch black because then you don't have anything to focus on other than yourself and just be relaxed maybe sit on a pillow or or something like that with your your legs crossed if you have difficulty crossing your knees you're a little bit older bring a chair in there and just sit down in a nice comfy chair and you may pass out you may fall asleep but you it's enough to just do it even for like five to ten minutes and just get your thoughts together and have no thought right? So just let thoughts pass through you. And if you are sitting and your mind is racing all over the place, just count in your head. Basically, I like this is like you talk to yourself, use that inside voice and say, be quiet. Say, shut up if you want to, you know, shut up. I want you to shut up right now. Be quiet and listen to your, your breathing, meaning go back to one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's what you should hear in your head. And if you start to go, why did they say that? And blah, blah, and all those internal thoughts. Tell yourself, be quiet. And sometimes if that's too harsh for yourself and you respond a little better, then be like the mother and just go, shh, just hush yourself. Just do that in your head or even do it to yourself under your breath. Shh, shh, quiet, shh, it's okay quiet. Shh. You can do that to yourself. And there's something about that sound, like all animals respond to that. And it does, it quiets them down. And so that having a strategy to be able to be relieving of the stress that you are in, and we're going to be in, we're going to be going through the stress even, how long is this? Until. And overcomers overcome. This is Jason Eagle, your natural health authority. I'm going to take a little commercial break and I'll be right back. Okay, everybody, we're back from that commercial break. And um, now we're going to talk about uh, another note. Uh, remind, I want to remind you that uh, a couple things. One, new podcast. Uh, will you, go to, you can go to any place that this podcast, like the Apple podcast or Spotify or, I mean, there's all kinds of different podcast type of places, Amazon, whatever. Um, you'll find me there. Um, and it's Healing Matters. You can do it all one word or you can separate it. It doesn't matter. Or you can put my name in, but uh, Jason Eagle. But it's Healing Matters is the name of the podcast show. Okay. Um, today, we're going to talk about frequent bruising. It's something that happens to a lot of people, especially older people, but it can happen to younger people. And in, in fact, it even happened to me um, at one point or time in my life and, and doesn't happen now. But what is it an indication of? Number one, uh, if you're older, one of the first things to be really uh, concerned about is that aspirin use, that baby aspirin. Oh, it's just a baby aspirin. Um, the worldwide research has shown that it can actually do more harm than good. It can weaken your capillaries and put you at a high risk of heart attack, 
um, strokes. Um, you can have explosions in terms of where the blood vessels break inside your brain or something like that because you've thinned the blood and thinned the vessels too much. The whole point is, is you don't want the blood to clot. So thinning the blood makes it anti-clotting, okay? But if you anti-clot it too much, then the blood gets too thin and uh, then there's some other risks. So there are some things that we can do instead of that. But uh, aside from that, how did you get there in the first place? It is a sign of low minerals, not having enough minerals. So one of the things that I like best for the minerals, minerals are the fermented greens. Greens mix, which has all of these green uh, vegetables, um, uh, kale and some of the grasses, and, and it's all organic and stuff like that. Um, the greens, the greener that a, a uh, so the super dark greens, they come from soils that have high levels of minerals. And those particular plants extract a lot of minerals. They extract a lot of the dark leaf, green leafies um, have a lot of magnesium. Um, but it also has all of the other minerals that you can think of as, as the, the sodium, as the potassium, as the um, zinc. It has all of the di different minerals. And that's what we're talking about. So the skin gets too thin. And it's, again, the blood vessels. It's because when you get bruising, what is bruising? When you get hit or and you see that bruise show up, what is it? If you were to zoom in underneath, what happened is, is that hit was enough to break blood vessels. And instead of bleeding out, if you cut yourself, bleeds, blood's going to pour out. Well, the skin is not broken, so you're bleeding on the inside. And then it just starts to solidify and it stays right there and it forms a blood clot. Or not a blood clot, I'm sorry, a bruise. Um, and what it is, is the blood that sits there gets darker and darker because it's it's dying and it's becoming dead blood and that's why it goes from this like the the darker to the the black and blue to then blue and then it even goes to like green you've seen the stages of where when a healing of a bruise it goes to green well that's like again if you saw a person that's dead <laughs> they look green because that's dead tissue. That's what happened. It's this blood that leaked out has now, and, and broken tissue, meaning it's it, you've torn some pieces of your body, in particular torn some micro blood vessels. It has to be carried out of there. So your body has to carry those dead bodies out and repair that damage, okay? So what made it weak in the first place was lack of minerals, lack of vitamin C. So scurvy, um, which is, you know, like pirate people, which is they would die from lack of vitamin C because they they had to eat hardtack and stuff like that. And they, you know, um, that's why the British were called limeys because the British learned that their Navy seamen had to be provided some form of vitamin C on a daily ration. And so they were given limes or apples or lemons or even kiwis. That's why, they, you know, they call them kiwis too, not just because they come from down under, but that's because they're very, very high in vitamin C and they were fed to the prisoners as well as fed to other people because um, when a person gets a deep enough vitamin C deficiency, they start to develop the bruises that the early warning sign is that you bruise easily. And then we get to a point where it's really bad and you'll just bleed out of your eyes and your nose and and you'll die, you'll bleed to death. And, but it's because vitamin C, what it does is it allows for the collagen to fill up the fibrin sacs. So your tissues, your skin, um, not only do you have blood vessels, but you have um, basically your body kind of looks like um, a like your flesh, like your muscles and your fat and all this other stuff. You got all these different types of tissues. It's all held together and it is by what's called fibrin and collagen. So collagen is that stuff that's nice and plumpy. And that's where you say, you know, like the baby fat or the baby, you know, when a person looks younger and their skin is nice and plump and, and elastic and, and you don't have wrinkles is because the collagen are, is filled up. So it's like this, you know, those bags that you have oranges in or that you put onions in, it's like those net bags, right? Well, think about like filling that up with like, say, jello, okay? 
when you fill up an, and like hard jello, what it will do is it's, if it's a liquid, it will leach out, right? But a jello will fit in between those layers of net. So you have a hole and the netting. Well, the netting is, that's what's called fibrin. And then the hole is, that's where the collagen is. So when you're young, the collagen fits right up to the edge of the fibrin, right? So it's basically a tile, you know, think about tile and grout. Right? So when you have a really good counter where, you know, or bathroom, you don't have any cracks in the grout. But if you get cracks in the grout, what's going to happen is that water will leak through there and you'll rot out your floor. So that's what um, scurvy is, is that you start reducing the uh, collagen and then that splits open where the fibrin is. And that's how we have the bleeds. And so again, when a person has, has frequent bruising or easily bruising, meaning you just bumped into me, like I can understand if you fall down and get hit hard, but there are many people that have this frequent bruising or easily bruised. It's like they just barely bump up against them and, ow, would you hurt me, hit me, and you didn't. It's just, they're that paper thin on the inside, okay? Um, castor oil packs is something that you can do right on those. You buy this castor oil pack at the health food store and then use some cotton flannel or like a, a piece of, let's say, some um, a cotton t-shirt or something like that, an old t-shirt, and you just pour some of the, the um, uh, castor oil onto that to saturate it and then put that over where the bruise is. And let it sit there for about an hour or so and then take it out and stick it in a Ziploc bag, you can use it again, but that will start to pull some of that stuff out and will make the uh, speed up the process of the bruise healing going away. Um, let me get back to what we use instead of aspirin. Instead of aspirin, worldwide research shows that fish oil, because there's two things that you can do. You can reduce the clotting factor, which is what makes it clump, uh, you know, um, clump together. Okay, and that could, you know, the reason that they want to reduce clot, because if you clot too much, then your blood will stick together and it will get stuck in your brain or it gets stuck in your heart and that can create an aneurysm. So you need to ride the line between sticky blood and slippery blood. And so ideally what you want is slippery blood. So the aspirin thins the blood, but it doesn't do the way that it should. What keeps your blood slippery is the essential fatty acids the fish oil or the DHA. So taking the DHA, which is a uh, microalgae, um, which is a plant-based one, or you can take the uh, EPA DHA, which is a fish oil. And the fish oil that we use, uh, the Premier Research Labs, is mackerel and sardines and anchovies that are turned into these pill form, or you can also take it in a liquid form. But uh, a daily dosage of an essential fatty acid um, like that krill oil, Dr. McCullough recommends the, his, he has a brand that has krill oil, which is these tiny little shrimp. Those are very, very good. Um, there's also the, the green lip mussels. Um, there's a lot of different of these fish oils, not just cod liver oil, but a daily dosage of that is going to safely make your blood slippery. It's also been, people don't know that they're worried about the cholesterol, but that's a good cholesterol. And it actually, if you got bad cholesterol, you should actually be taking more fat. Instead of cutting the fat out and going fat free, that's been shown to be wrong. So uh, in fact, putting people on a low fat diet actually um, decreases the HDL and you want to increase the HDL. HDL. There's HDL, LDL, triglycerides, total cholesterol. HDL is the number that you want up and high. And so if you need to get cholesterol deposits out of your bloodstream and stuff like that, you really need to, instead of avoiding the fish oil, you need the fish oil and you need a good dosage of fish oil. And like I said, going back to bruising, if we have frequent bruising, then we should be considering that we don't have enough of these essential nutrients, minerals, um, vitamin C, antioxidants. Um, uh, that's just where you're going to get in the greens mix. And I also, you should eat more green vegetables, more uh, fruits like pomegranate. There's a, you know, a super great way to get super phytonutrients is this pomegranate elixade, which is, it's basically this organic uh, pomegranate juice um, that you can 
even put in your water and, uh, you know, so you can drink. It has a little bit of flavor to it, but it's a way to get the pomegranate out. You don't have to make a super sweet juice out of it. You can just put, you know, the tart cherry juice is another way to get good antioxidants in blueberries. Um, there's an antioxidant mix that you can take um, that has all different types of, of uh, nutraceutical uh, antioxidants. Um, these are, and again, getting off of the baby aspirin worldwide research shows that um, aspirin, even a baby aspirin, daily ba baby aspirin predisposes you to more heart attacks than without it. Whereas the fish oil, completely safe. There's no problems with it whatsoever. It only can help. It can't hurt. And that's the thing. This is that there's some possible risk. Not possible. It, it's true. That's what they've seen is that there's definitely, they thought it was a good idea, but it's not a good idea because you can do it too much. And uh, then you can really risk creating the problem even worse than what you're trying to solve. Um, it's weird, but that's how the body, again, God created these bodies where there really is no cheating. You cannot cheat. Uh, Mother Nature, which is you have to, you are what you eat and what you don't eat. And you are what you digest and dissolve and absorb. That's everything. It's Jason Eagle, your natural health authority. And uh, we're going to talk about another one that I've seen a lot over the years. Carpal tunnel syndrome. People who, and let, me remind you, let me remind you, I have opinions on certain things, especially surgeries. And part of it is, is there's a lot of data out there. There's other experts that support that, but I'm talking to you from what I've seen in my own practice. And as a clinical massage therapist, body worker for a long time and nutritionist and all this other stuff, I've seen a lot and I've seen a lot of carpal tunnel. And I've seen a lot of people that went and had the surgery and it is probably the most unsuccessful surgery that I've ever known. The second one would be back surgery, low back surgery, like stenosis and stuff like that, which is sure they can cut it out, but the reason for having surgery is to get rid of the pain and then to bring my function back. And with carpal tunnel surgery, I've seen probably 80% of the people the pain is still there, and in fact, it might even be worse, and now they can barely hold a piece of paper. It didn't help, um, and it's a long way to go, and you can't repair it. Uh, they can, but it's, you know. So most of the time when people have had the surgery, they say, forget it, just don't do it. What I have found is carpal tunnel surgery. So again, the carpal tunnel, that's inside your wrist. They call it the carpal tunnel because if you saw your wrist, if you look at your hand where you've got your thumb, the pad of your thumb, and then the pad of, let's say, your pinky finger followed all the way to your wrist, you have that little tunnel. Well, if you see where the bones are, it actually literally makes a tunnel, which is there's a bone here and a bone here, and there's a valley, and that's where the nerve goes through. That's where the wrist median nerve that then splits into the different parts of your hand. Well, then it has like this elastic rubber band that's on it, and uh, that's just how we're built. It has a, a um, this it looks like a, a rubber band and that's what holds it in place. So carpal tunnel uh, theoretically is that nerve is being irritated and it's pushing up on those rubber bands. And so what the surgery is, is most what they do is they just cut that rubber band. So now the swelling is still there, but it's, it's not pushing against anything. But that tendon was there, that ligament and tendon was there for a purpose. And when you cut it, now that hand doesn't serve the same purpose. Now, where does that, now let's trace that nerve, where it goes to. The nerve goes all the way up your arm. It goes through your shoulder and up through your neck. And it goes to, we know exactly which vertebrae it goes to. It goes to T or C7, T1. That is the one that that makes the deltoid work, but that's also the nerve that goes down to the carpal tunnel. So you're feeling the pain in your wrist, but where is it coming from? If you're in a valley and you hear someone shouting in the valley, it, just because they sound like they're standing right next to you doesn't mean that they're there. They could be all the way up at the top of that mountain. And because of the way that the sound travels, so that's what I've found probably 90% of the time is that it's coming from your neck. It's coming from the pinched muscles, the pinched nerve at the neck. So the C7, and what is C7T1? That's that one 
at the base of your neck, just before your shoulders start. And it's the one that sticks up. Anytime when you see a person with carpal tunnel, that thing is sticking out like crazy. It looks like a big bone, a big bony prominence because they got that forward head posture. And so the mud packs are a thing to detoxify it and actually turn the energy back on. Because again, it means that the nerve is being pinched there and uh, that's what's shorting out your wrist. That's what's, you know, and this could have come because yes, you're sitting at the desk all the time, but it's not actually in your wrist. It's actually higher up in your neck or your shoulder, okay? So the mud packs work with that. Um, oftentimes carpal tunnel is also a, it's a joint infection. Or you, a lot of times I've seen people um, who are intolerant to wheat um, or have food allergies, um, it shows up in your joints. So you get people that, let's say, for instance, are, are heavy gluten intolerance. When you take them off of the gluten, because see, the, the gluten is feeding this infection that's living inside the joints. Sugar too. When I've uh, taken people and put them on a low carb diet and eliminate, especially the daily morning carbs, uh, don't have carbs for breakfast, then you don't feed that and that helps that to go away. Um, uh, weak adrenals. So we talked before about weak adrenals, the adrenaline. I would put person on adrenaline. Um, toxic liver. Um, uh, you So the joints, uh, and then also toxic liver and compacted colon. There's a huge correlation between, especially these weight ladies that work as, let's say, at a desk or something like that, typing all day long, they're constipated. There's a direct correlation between a lot of bad material in your colon, poop in your colon, that is literally leaching toxins into your joints and you feel it in your joints. So when we clean up the liver and we clean up the intestines, so there's uh, many when you have like compacted colon and stuff like that, going and getting colonics. And then after that day doing, let's say the cleanse blend, the you know, smooth move tea, whatever to get the bowels moving. Galactin is another type of thing. I've had so many people where just cleaning their body out made the carpal tunnel 80% uh, better. Um, a lot of times it's also a vitamin B deficiency um, so the max stress B, there is a complete B that we have as if you like to take it in pill form, but getting the B vitamins, um, B vitamins has also been one of the things that's been heavily shown for people with depression. Um, you get a lot of people who are bordering on, let's say, um, bipolar or just like um, real deep depression. Um, a vitamin B, just a good B complex in terms of taking, making sure you're getting enough Bs, a lot of times pulls people right out of it. And they're like, oh my God, that worked even better than the Prozac or worked better than, and, and it worked. And it, what it did is it fixed the deficiency. Um, the, uh, let's see, yes, the carpal tunnel, we talked about that. Oh, and then working on people. So a good chiropractor is often recommended. A body worker like me, uh, uh, adjusting a person's neck, releasing the muscles. A lot of times trigger point therapy, people up in these muscles, that especially that work at the desk, the muscles that are up in the trapezius, which is at the top of your shoulders when someone comes to give you a massage, are full of these hard crystals. And you push on them and you get, they crunch. Sometimes when they crunch, you even get nauseous because these are holding on to a lot of waste products. And so working deep tissue work into there absolutely helps a lot. Another thing that I've seen with um, is taping, the kinesio tape, or you know what you saw like the Olympic ladies when they were playing volleyball, they had that tape, or you'll see a lot of football players have this tape. Taping is a therapeutic use that can break up um, connective tissue adhesions, especially up on the neck. So where would you tape? People, well, should I tape my wrist? No, tape higher up. Oftentimes it's gonna be at the neck or it's gonna be at the sh right at the top of the shoulder or the shoulder joint. Sometimes it's in the elbow. Sometimes it's coming because see, what makes up the carpal tunnel is those two bones of the radius and the ulna. That's what makes up the elbow is those particular bones. The, the radius and the ulna at the elbow site are the two knobs. 
But those some same bones go down to, and the ulna is on the pinky, and the radius is on the thumb side. And that's what makes up the carpal tunnel, is those two bones that are there. So a lot of times the wrist is out, or the, the um, elbow is out of place, and those bones are out of place. So doing an adjustment of literally cracking a person's elbow, cracking their wrist, oftentimes relieves that. And they can feel like, oh, what, like their hands are all numb, or tingly and a good adjustment at the neck or shoulder or something like that. It's like suddenly their arm, and wouldn't that be better than surgery? Like you can't take back a surgery. And I've known so many people who, I know people have had it done two to three times and now they have so much scar tissue there that they're just, they're miserable. They are like, they wish they had never done it. And so this is a good way in terms of getting to it without ever doing it. Um, you know, it's something that's worth looking into. Um, another question here. This is Jason Eagle, your natural health authority. As I said, we're going to talk about the blood type. People have often asked, what do you know about the blood type diet? What do you think about that? Well, as we go, as we get into there's different blood types. And there's what's called blood type O. There's blood type A. There's blood type B. And then there's blood type AB. Now, we get into these where we get into positives, negative. I'm not going to talk about that because that's a little bit more in depth and that means those do mean something, but we're just going to take a wide shot in terms of let's just deal with just the letters on their own. And so what they talk about is, is they, they talk about it, it's based upon even the genetics in terms of what people formed first. So they believe that the very first type was actually type O. You would think A is first, no, but they say O is the first and the O is the caveman. So the blood type O is you're more of a carnivore by nature. Think caveman. You need to consume high protein foods like meat and fish. Fruits and vegetables are also very good for you. You need to limit your intake of grains, beans, and legumes. That's why a lot of times that are blood type O, they do better on the Atkins type of diet, the high protein. And when they do eat things like the beans and they get very gassy. So that's why you'll find a lot of like, say the Anglo-Saxon whites. So let's say you're Welsh or you come from England, feed those people beans like you would feed the Latinos and they become rocket power. They get so gassy. Um, it's because their intestines cannot digest it. They have actually shorter intestines. People that are carnivores have shorter intense intestines, which means from food to poop is much shorter period of time. Why? Because meat builds up very, very bad toxins. So like a, um, like a dog or a cat, they have shorter intestines than let's say a, a, a cow. So the plant-based things, or let's say, even let's say people that from the Latinos, the Mexican Americans or the Mexicans or the, um, the Mayans and stuff like that, they have literally longer intestines and that's why they can eat the beans and things like that because they can digest those sugars because it takes a lot longer. So food to poop for them is a much longer time. So they don't have to digest so fast. They can digest slower, okay? So this is the type O. If you are overweight, avoid wheat, corn, beans, lentils, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower. But those are all good, right? Well, but if you are a type of body that extracts more nutrients um, out of the meat, keep in mind the meat ate all of these things. The meat are eating the greens, the meat, the cows, and the lamb, and all of these, other, you know, the pigs. The meat, what they are eating is they're eating vegetables. They are eating these things and turning that into the flesh. So you're getting your vegetables just through the meat, right? Seafood, um, liver, red meat, Celtic sea salt, kale, broccoli, and spinach are the most beneficial foods for a type O. Now we get into type A. Blood type A, you are more of a natural vegetarian. And so the A is more vegetarian. In this case, um, vegetables, grains, beans, legumes, and fruits are good. Some seafood and tofu are also beneficial. If you are overweight as a type A, um, you need to avoid meat, dairy, kidney beans, wheat, and lima beans. Who likes lima beans? Anyways, <laughs> I like lima beans. I love them. But um, so that's one where you get into, let's say, the plant-based diet. Um, really works well for that. Type B is you are a balanced omnivore. It means you have a little bit of both. This means that you can metabolize all kinds of foods, meat, dairy, grains, 
beans, legumes, fruits, and vegetables are all good for you. Chicken may not be good for you. If you have a weight problem, avoid corn, wheat, lentils, peanuts, sesame seeds, and buckwheat. That's for the type B. Then we get into the last type, which is the type AB. So the type AB is you are an omnivore in moderation. You can eat most foods, but just not as free, freely as a type O person. For you, meat, seafood, dairy, tofu, fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, and legumes can all be consumed beneficially. If you have a weight problem, avoid red meat, kidney and lima beans, seeds, corn, and buckwheat. So that's a guideline on what we've learned about the blood type diet. And again, it's if you know your type, try it out and you just start experimenting with these foods and see how it works for you. Sometimes it works really well for people. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but who, be, who really benefit from this is people who are struggling with a lot of really weird type of body stuff and they've tried everything and it doesn't work. Start, get a blood type and figure out your blood type and start following that and it will help with autoimmune and these types, especially people that where they've dieted and the dieting does not make them lose weight. Because a lot of times when people are dieting as a blood type, they're eating the wrong types of foods and it's not going to work for them. When you find out what works for you, it becomes easy. And so that's the goal. This is Jason Hegel, your natural health authority. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.